given us to live in. And Father, it is an amazing creation that we take for granted each day as we move about on this planet. Father, help us always to recognize the tremendous display of power and knowledge that we cannot even comprehend that made it possible to create all the things around us. We're grateful for the changing of the seasons, the reminder of the passage of time. We're thankful for friends that we have, those that we see every day and those that return to us from time to time. We're grateful for our family. And Father, we're thankful this morning as we gather and worship for our church family, the opportunity we have to spend time together as we lift our hearts and our voices and our thoughts in glory to you in praise and prayer. We pray that you will bless us with those things that you knew would come to us from our worship. We're grateful for our time here in study. We pray that you'll help us to open our hearts and our minds as we go to the scriptures. We ask your blessings on those of our group who we've discussed and many others who we have not, the needs that they have. We ask your special blessings on Pam Pittman, that you will provide for her and strengthen her and the challenges that she faces with so many of her family. Father, we ask that you'll watch over us, help us each day as we go through life, forgive us of our sins, and when our time is complete, bring us home. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> this morning, we will uh, continue our discussion in Acts chapter 16 with verse 35, where we left off last week, two weeks ago. Um, our schedule is going to be still a little uh, quirky. I'm going to be out of pocket next Sunday, but then after that should be back for several uh, sessions, so we'll hopefully be able to, uh, to progress right along, but uh, uh, we will hopefully uh, well, we'll continue our discussion in Acts 16 this morning. In Acts 16 verse 9 Paul had a vision where God told him to go to Macedonia. Uh, or Paul inferred from the vision that uh, God was calling him to Macedonia. And so they went, Paul and Silas and their group, and uh, they traveled to Macedonia, and there they are going to have uh, great success. Uh, Lydia and her family will be the first converts in Philippi that we know of. Uh, the jailer and all of his family will be added to that group. And so these two families that we don't have a name for him uh, begin the core of what will be the church in Philippi. And of course it will uh, go on and uh, be very valuable and productive. Uh, the church in Philippi and, and clearly uh, many others uh, had, uh, had a great impact and, and will um, make reference to that a little further if we have time in, the, in a bit. We left off with Paul and Silas in prison. There was an earthquake as they were praying and singing at midnight. The uh, cell doors were opened. The prison was opened. They meet the jailer, save his life, proclaim the gospel to him, preach to him and his family. He carries them home. That's an interesting little experience right there. Uh, to his own house and provides for them and then uh, clearly puts them back into prison because they are, he's still their jailer and he's responsible for their lives and well-being. So they return to jail um, and uh, the next day is where we'll pick up at verse 35. When it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let these men or let those men go. You may have a note there regarding the officers. The uh, Greek text literally says the ones the beating ones, the, the rod bearers. Uh, so these are probably the guys, or at least very possibly the guys, uh, who actually did the beating. If not, they were in charge of delivering such things. And so now they are sent to let Paul and Silas out. Um, I can't imagine that being a, uh, a very good 
uh, discussion, but uh, nonetheless, their condescension is probably going to be short-lived. So they go to the jailer, uh, tell the jailer to release the prisoner, and uh, this man, who is now a brother in Christ, uh, the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. Um, can you imagine that conversation? Hey, good news. Uh, they've decided to let you go. You're free. Go on and have a good life. Live long and prosper. And uh, what do you do with that? Um, Paul says, um, not so fast. We're not ready to leave just yet. About 200 B.C. or so, uh, there came to be what would later be known as the Portian Law in the Roman Empire that uh, forbade Roman citizens uh, from being treated in certain ways. And uh, they could not be publicly beaten. They could not be put to death. They could not be imprisoned without first going through a trial. Now, interestingly enough, we have a similar law in our land, do we not? It's part of the Constitution of the United States, which goes back in our time to 1776. And uh, we talk about sometimes the concept of due process. We cannot be held accountable or have, have punishment brought upon us without having the opportunity to go through due process. That means charges have to be brought, things have to be proven. Once those th things are proven, then certain punishments can be brought about to a person. But you can't just be walking down the street, in theory, and have some police officer or some other person come up and just start wailing on you. Uh, it is a right of citizens of the United States. And, uh, and we hold, we prize those laws, do we not? And if the government was to act against us without due process, what would our response be? Irate? Out of sorts at least? And so Paul responds and says, nope, we're, we're not going out. Um, and here's Paul's charges. They have beaten us openly. That's a violation. Roman citizens could not be, would not be beaten in public. That was something that could be done to others, but not to a Roman citizen. Uncondemned. That means there was no trial. He did not have an opportunity to present his case. There was no information or um, charges brought that were verified. The magistrates of the city of Philippi got caught up in the mob action, and they just gave in to this mob that was already uh, beating on Paul and Silas. And uh, they were trying to please the group. Without a trial, number three, Romans. That's the clincher. Do what? So that's the clincher. Yeah, and when he said Romans, Romans, there are going to be a couple of times where Paul is going to use his citizenship to surprise people. Another one's going to be in his uh, being taken in Acts chapter 22, actually 21, and then into 22. Um, and we'll get to that. What year is this? Okay. <laughs> we'll get to that, you know, eventually, Lord willing. Uh, Romans. And we'll. Uh, what is the significance of Romans? Well, when Paul declares himself to be a Roman citizen, um, you know, a lot of things have changed. Now, why, why, would, why were they treated the way they were? Well, go back in um, verse 19. When her, her master saw that her hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. So what did the, uh, the leaders think regarding Paul and Silas? Their, their citizenship was somewhere other than Rome. They're Jews. They're not Romans. They don't have Roman rights. 
So we can treat them however we want to, and that's what they do. Uh, then that was uh, a, a little premature, and uh, Paul says, we are Romans, and you have thrown us in prison. Now, there was, there was the possibility of being held prior to trial, and we'll see that in Paul's life, especially in Acts chapter 28 when he appeals to Caesar. But what were the conditions in which Paul lived in Acts 28? He's in a house, he's got guards there, but he's, people are free to come and go. He is provided for well. That's what Romans were afforded. They were not held in confinement. It wasn't a torturous environment. So Paul says, you have taken us, beaten us openly, you can't do that. You didn't give us a trial, you can't do that. We're Romans, you can't do that. And then you have put us in a torturous prison, you can't do that. And now you think we're going to quietly go away? We are not going to go away quietly. The men who put us here, if they want us to leave, they'll have to come here. So now Paul's in the driver's seat, so to speak. And um, do they put us out secretly? What an interesting question. No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. Verse 38, And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Why were they afraid? When we started discussing the book of, of uh, Rome, of the city of Philippi, how did we describe Philippi? What is this town? This is a Roman city, okay? It has been annexed to the, uh, the power of Rome. This is a city in which many retired Roman officers uh, came to live. Kind of like Huntsville. <laughs> uh, Huntsville is an attractive place and many people decide to come and, and stay in. I wish that some of them would not find it so attractive presently, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the uh, um, the city of Philippi was full of Romans. So, what would happen if the Roman citizens in general found out that the leaders of the town had violated? the law concerning Roman citizens. That mob uproar that beat Paul and Silas would have or could have turned against them. They were in violation of everything and uh, there's, a, there's an allegiance. That, so that means that their justice system was still working. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, they, uh, they're frightened when they find out what has taken place. Um, and, uh, and there's a reason for them to be frightened. There are rights that we have as Americans, and um, I'm thankful for them. Uh, Paul did not hold his citizenship as a Roman citizen above being a Christian. In fact, Paul is going to say just the opposite in the book of Philippians. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, but nonetheless, he recognized that he had the rights of a Roman a citizen, and so he took advantage of these from time to time. So um, we have rights, and uh, it is not wrong to avail ourselves of the laws that protect us from harm or, or uh, uh, ill will or... Am I brave enough to say this? Hmm? Violations of voting protocol or whatever else may happen in the world. There are certain things that, that uh, they should be done. They should be done according to the law. All right, verse 39. Then they came. Who's they? Well, you're going to assume that is the magistrates who are in power. And they pleaded with them and brought them out. What's involved in pleading with someone? Please. <laughs> What would this have included? They're trying to make them happy, trying to please them. Yeah. Oh, no. 
yeah. ESV translate. It, it's not a good translation, but translates it as apologized to them. The word apologize is not in there. No, it is not. But is it reasonable to assume that apology was given to Paul and Silas? Oh, yeah. Yes. You, you can hardly imagine them pleading with them without apologizing for the actions that have been brought to them. So, yeah, they come and now they're eating humble pie. They, they are in trouble. They know they're in trouble. Paul has the right to... What power did Paul have at this point? He had the right to appeal to Caesar. Who could... What would happen if Paul decided to press charges? That person would be in jail. Everybody who was involved in what took place would receive at the least the punishment that it was wrongly inflicted upon Paul. But the law called for those who were involved in the violation of Roman citizens' rights to be summarily executed. That's right. If you violated the law of Rome against a Roman citizen, the punishment for that was death. That was to protect Roman citizens. So you don't mess with the Roman law system. Uh, so these guys, had Paul pushed it, could have been put to death. They would at least lost their, their place in their, in their town. So this is really serious when we read this. And Paul's in the place where he could have made this happen. But So they are pleading with him and Silas, please go away and uh, don't cause us you know, any harm here. Is it surprising to, to, to find them pleading with Paul and Silas to leave? No, you, you don't want them around. But there are other places where we, uh, we find interesting things. Um, Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Jesus came to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes. He met two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. Um, Jesus calls, uh, the demons call out, verse 31, begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. Jesus allows this, verse 32. Uh, when they come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they marveled. They asked him to stay, to perform miracles for them, to help their, heal their sick. No. They pleaded with him to leave. Please go away. You are powerful and we don't want no trouble. There are times when folks are afraid of power. And there's, there's a reason for it. Uh, it's dangerous to be around uh, things where powerful people and, and uh, threats are. I don't know if I've told this story in this city. I've told it privately a time or two. I had uh, one of the elders uh, in the church at uh, Parkway uh, was worked for the civilian side of the Army and uh, he was the direct deputy director for the missile defense program working under the general out on the arsenal and uh, his general got moved or whatever however things do like that in the army uh, to washington dc and i thought that'd be the end of him that he would never leave washington dc a few years later they uh he's back in town and we ate lunch together and uh i said i thought when you got to washington that that'd just be home. You'd stay there involved. With, uh, he was working in the Pentagon and things of that sort. And he said, no, no, no. He said, you don't want to be there. I said, why not? He said, it's dangerous. And that took me, that took me back. I, I didn't understand. I said, it's dangerous. Now, you know, it may have been lots of things. How can it be dangerous? Because you're around a lot of powerful people. And there are various reasons why powerful people do things that they can do with their power. And he 
he didn't want to be there. He, he wanted to be somewhere else. Came to understand the significance of that. Uh, is that why Paul and Silas were sent elsewhere? Well, they cast out the demon. They're clearly uh, <coughs> creating trouble. They ask them to depart. They don't understand Paul and Silas. And we tend to want to get away from those kind of things. All right. Um, thought, question, observation you want to make regarding Paul in prison before we continue? I wonder how they provide a proof of citizenship. Would this take for the word? Or <coughs> on a register somewhere? Good question. Cool. Don't know. Did he flash his ID? Probably, I looked, yeah, probably didn't have one. I, I looked it up. They didn't have IDs. Right. I no. Mean, but, I, I, I mean, and they didn't really say how the Roman citizens were. I mean, anybody can say, yeah, I'm a Roman. Look what you did to me. And, well, um, there's there's clearly a process, and uh, I say that because uh, let's go forward to chapter 22. And start reading ahead. Verse 22, Acts 22. They listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth where he's not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. People are shouting against Paul. They're going to have Paul beaten, not just beaten, scourged, which is one of the harshest forms of beating. The uh, implement that they used was a leather whip with many... Uh, strings in it, something in the order of two feet long or so, tied together into a handle, and into that leather, those leather straps, many of them, were embedded pieces of bone, glass, chips of, of rock, and other things. They were designed to tear apart human flesh as they whipped them. Scourging by itself was often fatal. This is a horrible thing. Can beating with canes or rods or even whips, nothing like scourging. Okay, so that's the threat that he's going to do. Um, verse 25, as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? There were only a few crimes for which a Roman could be scourged, and then only after trial. When the centurion heard that, he went out and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. So Paul is freeborn. How was it that Paul is a freeborn Roman, uh, a freeborn Roman, since he is Jewish? Where's Paul from? Paul of Tarsus. Okay, Tarsus, like Philippi, uh, was a Roman city, and so Paul grew up with the right of citizenship being a Roman because he was born into a city that was a portal of Rome. How did everyone in here become citizens of the United States except for Suzanne? My guess is that everyone in this room was born an American either on the American soil or on a, a base uh, in foreign soil that was, that was American territory or uh, something of that nature. Uh, this man, though, he bought his citizenship. You could clearly have, there was a path uh, to create this. And he says, I bought my way in. Paul says, I'm free born. Uh, you are, I'm sure, aware of the many immigration laws that we have in the United States and the Constitution and the attempt of people to make sure their children are born 
here in the United States. And why do pregnant women walk hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles trying to cross a border where they may drown to get there, uh, to get to America as a pregnant woman? Because if the children are born in the United States, then they become citizens of the United States. And that is very valuable to them. So they will risk much in coming. All right, so things are not as different when we look back as, as they seem to be sometimes. And sometimes things that are very current uh, for us uh, were the ways of life in the past. All right, good question, Steve. Yes. I think we see too the foresight of God and all this. Of course, Paul was picked out being on the opposite team, you might say, and, and brought in uh, with some influences on him to become a Christian, realize his wrongs and everything. But God knew where he'd been, knew what his assets were, so to speak. <coughs> There are a number of very special choices made in Scripture that, that, that make great stories. Uh, Noah being one. The world is wicked. God, because of Noah's righteousness, chooses Noah and his family to be saved, to build an ark. Abraham, Acts, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, why was Abraham selected? Well, was it his person, his character? What's going to take place? Maybe all of those things, but Abraham is chosen by God uh, to be uh, in a covenant, a, a contract, a, a, an agreement with God. And he says, I will do this for you, you do this for me. So uh, there was a, a quid pro quo, if you will, uh, responsibilities on both parts. God said, I'll provide for you. I will make your family a great nation. You will be the uh, the inheritor, or the, your children will be the inheritors of all of this land. Wherever you walk, wherever the sole of your feet touches, they will possess this land. Um, Joseph, chosen for a very special purpose in life. Uh, his work in Egypt, uh, God raises him to power. If you can't see the hand of God in the, the life of Joseph, you can't see the hand of God uh, because that, uh, it's, it's full there as Moses does this excuse me as Joseph does that then Moses coming from from his place the various prophets who were raised up uh, Jeremiah uh, declares that God said before you were born in the womb I knew you and I chose you to be a prophet to the nations God had a plan for Jeremiah well Paul Saul of Tarsus certainly is one who God had a, uh, a very specific interest in uh, Saul was uh, an educated man. He was trained in the ways of the Jews. He was a Roman citizen. Therefore, he could travel freely throughout the world. What would have happened if this had been Peter in this jail instead of Paul? He would have left hat in hand, and uh, who knows what would have happened to him. What if he'd been picked up in Acts 22 uh, and examined under scourging as to what the problem was? Oh, they killed him. Uh, or very likely could have killed him because of uh, if it, if he had been doing what Paul is going to end up doing. But Paul has, he has feet in more than one um, world. He, he understands the Jewish world intimately. He is Jewish all through and through to the core of his being. But he is also Roman. He was raised Roman. He was raised by in free Rome. And so... He is, has the ability to walk among the Jews or among the Romans and move comfortably in and out. So he is a special tool. In fact, when uh, we find him in the uh, discussion in Acts chapter 9, um, the Lord says to Ananias, he is a chosen vessel to carry the gospel to the world, to kings, to empires. This guy is important. He's, he's significant. May not have looked like it to us, but uh, yes, ma'am. So, um, so in this text, so Silas and Silas is also a Roman citizen, right? Silas. Silas, right? Uh, no, uh, we don't know how it's pronounced. Probably it's not Silas. <laughs> um, because he says that, that you know 
they have beaten us. Us, uncondemned. So, I suspect that Silas was also Roman. Silas is not a Jewish name. But when, when we go back to what you just said, you kind of see, show us how the, the storyline and how pe how God chose people. Uh -huh. So now we can also look back and see the that fight was in the beginning with Barnabas and, and Sean, you know, Mark separating from right. how that was actually a good thing because they would have ended up in the situation. What would have happened if Barnabas was here instead of Silas? Mm -hmm. Barnabas was not a Roman citizen. He was a Jew. He would not have had the rights of protection. So would it be impossible to make a case that God diverted Barnabas from this path in order to keep him from being killed, dealt with in this way? He can make a case. We don't have the, we do not see the hand of God working. We see the results of life and we are left to extrapolate from certain principles. But yeah, Barnabas is protected from, well, if he was here, it would have been much worse for Barnabas. He would not have had the right to say, I'm Roman. We do not see the wind, we see the effects of the wind. <laughs> anyway, that's why my wife does not like to fly with me. <laughs> <laughs> she looks out the window and she sees nothing. She doesn't like it. <laughs> I've explained it many, many times. Stick your hand out. It's there. <laughs> All right. Good thoughts. Anything else? I just wonder why Paul didn't declare himself a Roman before they beat him. Well, it'd be speculation. A um, couple of reasons. One, he's caught up in a mob frenzy. Uh, so they take him before the magistrate. Yeah, he could have declared himself, but uh, they're they're already uh, they're stirred up. Um, <clears throat> again, we're back to we don't know why. Uh, dragged him into the marketplace. The magistrates uh, tore off their clothes, uh, tore their clothes, commanded them to be beaten with them. The multitude rose up together against them, verse 22. The, the, the group, the whole mob action against Paul was uh, not favorable to a, uh, uh, a quiet conversation. We don't know how this all happened. It could have you know, just been a rough and tumble they grabbed him up, beat him up, dragged him to the magistrates. This guy's doing what it is. Yeah, beat him. And it just, it just happened, bam, bam, bam. And, you know, they're thrown away. Well, you go back to the hand of God. If he had declared himself, he never would have met the jailer. Wouldn't have met the jailer. Paul had to be in jail to make contact with the jailer. So, yeah, there. you know, when we start talking about why, the, there are... One of the conversations that comes up in, converse, in, in our discussion from time to time is why do bad things happen to good people? Well, sometimes the things that look bad down the road bring about things that are good. And Paul will describe this in Romans chapter 8, that uh, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Uh, that does not mean all things are good, but that they good things can come from them. Joseph is a perfect example of that. Joseph had horrible treatment throughout his life, but look what it did for the people of God. Don? Uh, I was just going to add to that, that 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 was one of the things that Paul said that, that that's basically the only thing it's good to be proud about is to be, be able to be proud to suffer in the name of Christ. He does, and, and that uh, when he talks to the Philippians in chapter 3 and 4, in both of those cases, he will talk about um, that. Um, when Paul was a Roman Jewish Roman, yes, and he was persecuting the Christians, yes, the fact that he was a Jew didn't bother the Roman thing. No, hmm. they wouldn't care what Romans did to Jews. Jews had no rights, but he was. But he was persecuting the He was persecuting the Christians. Christians. Yeah, but he was on the he was in with the Jewish authority and the Jewish authorities actually ran the town at right. Jerusalem. Yeah. Until things got really out of out of whack, then the Romans would step in. All right, but let's let's go on. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, 
And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. All right, they come out of prison. They go back where? Lydia's house. Why Lydia's house? Well, that's where they've been staying. Not only do they say, see her, but who else do they see? The brethren. Who are the brethren? Paul and Silas have been preaching in the town of Philippi. We only know of the Ethiop uh, we only know of the jailer and Lydia. But what can we assume has been happening while he was there? Convergence. Other people were being converted. Now, go with me real quick. Philippians chapter 1. Listen to how Paul opens this book. Now, we don't know who else is going to be in Philippi and, and what will happen. Um, I can't talk and find my page, so hold on a second. Okay, Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Silas, excuse me, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. What has happened to this church? It has, it is mature. It has grown up. This is a group that has bishops and elders and deacons in an established church in the first century world within the lifetime of Paul the Apostle. Congregations just like ours are existing. And then Paul goes on to describe all the things there and, and everything. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Who was there? A, a, a whole church. Paul had started it. Okay, so he leaves from the... the uh, um, prison. He goes and sees Lydia and she comforts him. No. It says Paul comforted them. When they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. The church there in Philippi, what a horrible thing. Poor Paul. And Paul, no, no, this is not poor Paul. Paul is encouraging the brethren, though. I know. I mean, the bre I mean, encouraging the brethren, but wouldn't couldn't the brethren be kind of looking like, oh, kind of scared? At well, yes, it's terrible. Them. I mean, so and, they had to make them. Scared. Okay. We, we need to keep reading. <laughs> Should it, let's keep going down to Philippians a little farther. Listen how Paul sees everything that's involved here. Uh, okay. Thank God upon every member of you. Verse three. Uh, be confident of this, for God is my witness. I long for you all. Okay, verse 12, Philippians 1 12. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard. Paul's in prison here when he's writing it to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, some also from goodwill. Paul says, you know, I'm in prison. Terrible things have happened. No, they're not terrible. Everything that has happened to me has benefited the gospel. Even the guards of the Roman emperor know why I'm here, that I am a prisoner in chains because of the gospel. And he said, and the brethren are made bold because they see what's happened to me and they are willing to, to give heart to this. Paul and Silas are an encouragement to the church in Philippi even when they were persecuted. It made them bold. Wonderful words. Thank you for your time together. Next week, Lord willing, I will not be here, but uh, the following week we'll pick up and start in chapter 17.